Our story begins far outside the Milky Way galaxy. Millions of years before even the faintest whisper of human civilization was to be heard across the stars. This tale spans countless millennia, a result of great civilizations rising to unimaginable heights and then fading from memory. The figures at the center of it all wielded powers far beyond human understanding, seeking to act as protectors and caretakers of the universe. But through a cruel twist of cosmic fate, these same creators would later arise as a force that would threaten all life in the universe. The Precursors. Originating beyond the Milky Way, traversed into our galaxy eons ago. They were an alien race that epitomized an extraordinary level of advancement. Venturing across galaxies and initiating life as part of a grand experiment spanning billions of years. Existing as transcendent entities, they transcended conventional sapience. Described as visionary creators whose consciousness spanned myriad realms, embodying infinite forms and voices with a singular purpose. Unbound by specific physical forms, the precursors seamlessly adopted shapes at will, undergoing cycles of demise and rebirth, embracing diverse incarnations, both corporeal and ethereal. Their existence fluctuated between epochs of advanced spacefaring civilizations and periods of primal simplicity confined to their planetary abodes. Through the use of a novel technology known as neural physics, the precursors wielded meta-technological prowess to manipulate the universe's fabric. Their understanding of neural physics was core to their belief that the universe is a sentient entity. Distinct, yet interconnected with organic life forms. Central to their civilization was the belief in the enrichment of the universal whole through the diverse experiences of biological organisms. a concept they intimately grasped through their ever-evolving existence. The precursors didn't adhere strictly to benevolence, acknowledging strife, pain, and even malevolence as intrinsic elements of the cosmos. The interplay of good and evil, along with the myriad sensations beyond human comprehension, contributed to what they termed the sweetness of existence. The precursors took on the monumental task of populating the Milky Way with life, crafting a diverse array of species and meticulously engineering millions of star systems. As part of their stewardship of all life, they held the mantle, a role of guardianship, and periodically evaluated species to determine their worthiness for succession. If a worthy species was discovered, all their knowledge and technology would be passed on to them. That species would then rise to the same cosmic responsibilities that the precursors once held. Among their finest creations were the Forerunners, humanoid beings indigenous to the planet Gibalb, initially designed by the precursors to assist and support them. However, over time, the Forerunners were deemed unfit to inherit the mantle with records suggesting a planned eradication. Instead, the precursors had turned their gaze towards ancient humanity from the planet Erditirene as their chosen successors. In a pivotal moment around 10 million BCE, during an expedition to Path Cathona, the forerunners stumbled upon their creator's intentions for their demise. In a desperate bid to rewrite their fate, 
the Forerunners launched a furious assault on the Precursors. They waged a war of genocide, driving the Precursors to the brink of extinction in both the Milky Way and the satellite galaxy of Path Kethena. As most galactic historians agree, the ease at which the Forerunners massacred such an advanced race implies that the Precursors did not make a significant effort to defend themselves. They simply chose to evade or be wiped out by their creations. Only a scant few managed to evade their relentless campaign. Some Precursors managed to escape or were spared by the Forerunners, opting for suspended animation. However, many more chose to use their mastery of spatial manipulation to transform themselves into molecular dust intended to hibernate for an extended period of time before reforming into their original physical forms. Millions of years later, the Forerunners had established themselves as the dominant power in the galaxy, employing technology that began to rival their slain forebearers. But in a small corner of the Milky Way, humanity had also risen to new heights in their master's absence, creating a space-faring civilization that was nearly on par with the Forerunners themselves. Yet darkness was merely lying in wait all this time. Watching civilization rise as it once had, patiently biding its time to claim retribution and wipe out all life across the stars. Sometime prior to 107,045 BCE, humanity had come into contact with the devolved precursor dust. This fine, desiccated substance had been stored within millions of glass cylinders aboard automated starships, traversing from the direction of the large Magellanic Cloud towards the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy. The remnants of these vessels were stumbled upon by ancient humans across inhabited and deserted worlds near the fringes of intergalactic space, a frontier they had expanded into early in their history. Within these ships, humanity discovered capsules containing the powder, initially perceived as inert, short-chain organic molecules of unknown function. Upon examination, humanity deemed the substance harmless, but noted its psychotropic effects on lower animals. Small doses were administered to Feru, favored domestic creatures among humans and their alien ally, the San Shayum, resulting in increased docility. Unbeknownst to them, the powder subtly altered the genetic makeup of the Feru, initially manifesting as improved behavior before gradually inducing further genetic alterations. After centuries of exposure, alarming transformations emerged among the Feru. Those treated with the powder began to develop furry growths and fleshy protrusions which others of their kind felt compelled to consume. Subsequently, genetic deformities afflicted the Feru, leading to their euthanasia or release into the wild. Soon thereafter, humans and San Shayum who had been in contact with the altered Feru began exhibiting symptoms of the powder-induced disease. Affected individuals, driven by psychological changes, resorted to consuming the infected feru, inadvertently spreading the affliction. Parts of their discarded tissue and limbs also served as vectors for the disease, accelerating its dissemination. As the infection spread, a transition from primarily psychological alterations to physical transformations began. Victims would have their bodies violently transformed upon infection with the disease. This was the birth of the beings known as the Flood. The Precursors returned.
the spread of the infection rapidly engulfed both human and forerunner territories. Defying attempts at containment and infiltrating hundreds of worlds across 15 systems, human fleets responded by destroying flood-infested forerunner vessels and purging planets where infestations were identified, all without warning the forerunners in advance to prevent the flood from gaining ground. This strategy, however, backfired as many forerunners interpreted these actions as aggressive maneuvers, sparking the onset of the human forerunner wars. Amidst the chaos, humanity found itself weakened by the flood onslaught and embroiled in a simultaneous conflict against the forerunners. Initially, the forerunners celebrated swift victories over humanity, only to witness the unexpected retreat of the flood from human territories. Encountering healthy human worlds within flood-infested sectors, the forerunners speculated that humanity had developed a resistance or cure to the infection. However, it was later revealed that the flood had simply ceased their assault on humans, perhaps in a calculated move to manipulate perceptions and further stoke mistrust between the two civilizations. As the forerunners confronted the flood for the first time, the parasite inflicted severe damage on their fleets before mysteriously withdrawing from the galaxy. This retreat allowed the forerunners to eradicate active infestations across thousands of worlds, albeit with difficulty in obtaining intact specimens for study. The flood's influence extended even to AI, corrupting them irreparably with what would be termed the logic plague. Although humanity managed to recover some strength as the flood receded, they continued to face formidable opposition from the forerunners. Exhausted and depleted from combating the flood, humanity eventually retreated to their capital, Charum Hakor, where they faced defeat. In the aftermath, the forerunners devolved humanity to pre-industrial levels as punishment and exiled them to their homeworld, erasing all traces of their existence from the galaxy. When the flood resurfaced as a significant threat in the galaxy, the forerunners grossly underestimated the danger posed by this parasitic organism. Initially employing tactics more aligned with disease control rather than outright warfare, the forerunners soon found themselves facing a much deadlier and cunning adversary as the infection spread. Initially lacking strategic acumen, the flood swiftly evolved, gaining large amounts of biomass and giving rise to grave mines, massive organic entities embodying collective intelligence for the flood species. These grave mines coordinated flood swarms in devastating attacks against forerunner fleets, utilizing seemingly telepathic control over all flood forms within their vast reach. A favored tactic of the flood involved the use of unarmed civilian vessels to infiltrate planetary defense groups, bypassing forerunner orbital fleets and initiating infestations on planets and among their populations. The sheer numbers of flood forms overwhelmed forerunner ground forces, with billions dedicated to planetary assaults, threatening every member of the forerunner population as potential hosts. Facing desperate circumstances, the forerunner armada resorted to full planetary bombardment on infested worlds, despite the significant loss of forerunner lives due to evacuation challenges. In instances where naval garrisons couldn't initiate bombardment, Major forerunner population centers activated localized weapons of mass destruction, effectively halting the growing infestation at the cost of mass casualties. These events underscored the dire situation and the extreme measures taken by the forerunners to combat the flood threat the flood's exponential growth saw it spreading from system to system, driven not by a desire for warfare against forerunner battle groups, but with the intent to infect the forerunner population. As the flood expanded its reach, 
entire planetary biospheres succumbed to conversion into flood biomass. Key minds, focal points of grave mind intelligence, soon surpassed the forerunners in computational prowess alone. Despite the forerunners' relentless efforts, the logic plague evolved, adapting to defy all defenses and infiltrating AIs and data networks, crippling forerunner military capabilities heavily reliant on AI automation. Compounding the challenge was the Flood's capacity to manipulate precursor technology, seizing control of precursor megastructures like the Star Roads to assail forerunner planets and naval forces. This capability stemmed from the Flood's corrupted precursor origins, granting them access to neural physics and enabling them to activate precursor artifacts. Furthermore, the proliferation of high-level key mind nodes facilitated the Flood's use of neural physics-based superluminal transit, hindering forerunner slipspace travel. Towards the later stages of the infestation, the very perception of space itself seemed to turn hostile and ominous due to Flood-based neural physics. Despite myriad containment efforts, the forerunners found themselves ultimately resorting to a Pyrrhic solution the activation of the Halo Array. A network of seven ring-shaped megastructures intended as super weapons to purge the galaxy of all sentient life. Recognizing the Flood's parasitic nature and its dependency on potential hosts, the forerunners reasoned that eliminating all such hosts would starve the Flood into extinction. This decision, however, sparked political strife and even civil war among the forerunners. Nevertheless, after exhausting all other options, the forerunners activated the halos, initiating a drastic and irreversible measure to combat the flood threat. The activation of the seven halo installations effectively contained and ultimately eradicated the surviving flood. The only remnants of the parasite were securely contained within state-of-the-art, high-security forerunner research facilities, including the Halo installations themselves and specific shield worlds. All precursor artifacts and structures, reliant on neural physics for composition and maintenance, were systematically destroyed, leaving no trace behind. Despite this extensive eradication effort, numerous sentient species, including humanity, survived the Halo Array's activation, having been safely relocated beyond the galaxy by the forerunners through the Ark. Humanity would be destined to take on the mantle as the forerunners once had. Yet they would be forever haunted by the looming presence of their creators returning once again to wage a war of extermination through the Flood. But for many millennia, humanity would slowly rise once more, blissfully unaware of the danger that lurked from the shadows of the cosmic void. As despite the activation of the halos, the flood was merely held back for an extended period of time. It is possible that the flood may never be completely erased, existing as a galactic constant, acting as the rising tide that comes nightly to sweep away the sand on the beach. The Flood represents an anomaly that defies all known principles of biology. Their modes of growth and reproduction render them fundamentally incompatible with any natural ecosystem. Exhibiting an extreme level of adaptability, they transform hosts to suit the evolving needs of their species, demonstrating an ability to survive in extreme environments ranging from negative 75 to 53 degrees Celsius, as well as submerged underwater the Flood can withstand the varied environmental conditions present on all known inhabited planets. However, the Flood appears to thrive optimally in moist and humid atmospheres. It has been theorized that the artificially induced extreme weather patterns in certain critical areas of the halo rings are intended as a means to hinder Flood proliferation. 
In order to create living conditions ideally suited to their needs, the flood will actively transform the environment, altering the atmosphere and coating solid surfaces with a layer of flood biomass. All flood biomatter consists of a unique, undifferentiated supercell which serves to relay information and coordinate cellular assembly in a manner analogous to conventional neural cells. Remarkably, it also exhibits the capability to flex and move in coordinated patterns with other cells as well as arrange itself to mimic any bodily organ required for flood subsistence. This amalgamation of traits has led some researchers to describe it as thinking muscle. Structurally, the flood supercell bears resemblance to both neuron and glial cells, featuring a central cell body with numerous tendril-like branching extensions projecting outward. To proliferate and increase its biomass, the flood relies on infecting and assimilating other life forms. While it can infect almost any organism, it demonstrates a strong preference for sentient beings as assimilating their cerebral tissue enhances its overall intelligence. The initial phase of a flood outbreak typically begins with contact with flood spores or simpler forms of flood biomatter should no existing flood forms be present. Once an initial infestation is established, flood infection is usually carried out by pod infectors, complex forms generated from flood biomass during the feral stage. These infectors target hosts by leaping for the most accessible area of the victim's torso, often the left side of the chest below the neck for bipedal species. Upon contact, the pod infector burrows into the chest cavity, inflicting mortal wounds. As the host perishes, the pod infector extends tentacles to tap into the victim's spinal cord or nerve center, mimicking the nerve signals produced by the host's living brain. To commence the physiological conversion of a host, the pod infector injects encapsulated flood supercells into the body, analyzing the host's genetic code for optimal utilization. Simultaneously, flood cells break down the host cells into organic material, which is absorbed and assimilated. The flood utilizes the absorbed biomass to generate new masses of flood supercells. As it depletes the host's resources, particularly calcium reserves, the parasite cells augment the host's framework to produce various feral stage flood forms. This entire process, from initial infection to complete control over a fully mutated host body, occurs rapidly, typically within seconds. The infection isn't restricted to living hosts. Even deceased organisms are susceptible as long as their bodies and nervous systems haven't completely deteriorated. The pod infector can infect and convert hosts as long as they haven't decomposed beyond usability. The flood infection efficiently utilizes the host's biological resources, rapidly consuming and transforming them. Throughout the entire process, the pod infector sustains the host's life by chemically isolating the dying brain, preventing signals of brain death from reaching the rest of the body and causing it to shut down. This is crucial for the parasite's objective of consuming and transforming the host organism. While pod infectors serve as effective and cost-efficient vectors of infection, particularly against armored targets, the flood can also infect hosts through alternative methods. Inhaled flood spores can trigger the transformation into combat forms, which becomes the primary method of infection during advanced outbreaks. Flood spores are dispersed into the local environment in large quantities, swiftly overwhelming unprotected biological targets. Additionally, infection can occur through contact with lacerated tissue, turning any flood form into a potential carrier. Even the most basic form of flood genetic material is highly contagious. Once introduced into a host, it gradually mutates the host's DNA across generations until it can generate its own flood supercells. Host organisms infected by these means typically undergo restrained mutations that preserve the structure and form of the original life form, albeit with numerous additional appendages and organs such as sensory stalks, haphazardly integrated. Pod infectors are highly selective, targeting species with sentient intelligence and adequate biomass. They can infest intact or lightly wounded deceased bodies, as the host organism succumbs to the initial attack, tendrils pierce the skin 
and reach the spinal cord, synchronizing with the nervous system and assuming control of the body. The consciousness of the host is replaced by the insatiable hunger of the flood, although certain useful memories, such as battle strategies and technical knowledge, are retained. However, the original mind is entirely supplanted, leaving only a primal urge to assimilate other species. Remarkably, the flood can seemingly absorb and simulate the consciousness of their victims within the grave mind. In rare instances, such as when specific information is sought from an individual's mind, the flood employ an alternate method of infestation. This method allows them to burrow into the host's mind, gradually gaining access to all of their memories. Notably, this was observed when the flood sought information from Captain Jacob Keyes. God, it hurts! This will never work, you covenant bastards! I'll never lead you to Earth! Captain. Service number 01928-19912-JK. Oh, God. You don't want Earth. You want everything. Get out of my head. <laughs> Is that you? Forget everything. No, please. Don't let me forget. Jeez. Jacob. Captain. Service number. 1928-19912-J. No more. What you were. Memories. Emotions. All is now ours. If the initiating pod infector is severely aged or damaged, the host may remain alive and conscious. Private Wallace Jenkins experienced this retaining awareness despite the mutation of his form and occasionally exerting control over his body when flood instincts were dormant. Once enough sentient hosts are amassed to form a grave mind, the flood's behavior becomes highly coordinated, significantly enhancing their collective lethality. The grave mind may communicate directly through controlled combat and pure forms. While the baseline neurological assimilation remains consistent across host species, the flood infection process entails various physiological transformations tailored to the host's capabilities and the flood's combat needs. Upon infection, higher level species with substantial physical strength are typically transformed into combat forms where the host's physiology undergoes a complete rewrite. Organ-based systems are corrupted. Organ-specific functions become decentralized and body cavities decay rendering targeted incapacitation difficult and brute force ineffective. Even decapitation fails to halt or slow down a combat form due to the lack of a central nervous system. Traditional high-speed penetrating munitions like sniper rifle rounds often prove ineffective against combat forms. Targeting specific areas yields minimal physiological hindrance as projectiles swiftly penetrate decayed flesh without causing significant damage. Combat forms develop tentacles and claw-like structures for melee combat, with one arm typically transforming into a clawed appendage, while the other retains object manipulation abilities. The rapid growth of these structures often results in the displacement and fragmentation of the host's hands and forearms. Combat forms also exhibit formidable strength, speed, agility and leaping abilities, surpassing those of the original host organism. However, these formidable abilities come at a cost. The rapid and extreme metabolism required by combat forms leads to the swift breakdown of the host organism's corpse by the parasite. Infected life forms eventually degrade into carrier forms, serving as mobile generators and incubators for pod infectors. Pod infectors and pure forms utilize specialized tentacles tipped with red ganglia 
to sense their surroundings, though the exact mechanism remains unknown. These tentacles typically protrude from the chest cavity of combat forms or the head segment of pure forms. These transformations occur before the flood has fully subdued resistance in a given area. Once significant resistance has been overcome, organisms are no longer converted into combat forms, but are instead used to create a grave mine or processed into biomass for a flood hive. As the flood outbreak progresses, it evolves into a formidable self-replicating swarm that adapts to utilize any available mechanism, be it philosophical, ideological or technological, to further its goals. This adaptability was most evident during significant outbreaks, particularly the Forerunner Flood War. One of the most striking characteristics of the Flood is its metabiological aspect known as the Logic Plague. This abstract infection spreads through information transmission and exchange, particularly targeting artificial intelligences. The methods employed to propagate this infection range from subtle philosophical persuasion during discourse to more aggressive tactics like overwhelming AI networks with self-replicating information infestations. This was one of the key moments in the Flood's advancement that allowed them to overwhelm the Forerunners. As the Flood clashed with the Forerunners, accumulating vast intellectual capacity through key minds on several planets, it gained the ability to manipulate neural physics, the foundational principles of precursor technology. This newfound capability allowed the Flood to awaken dormant precursor structures, notably star roads, and repurpose them as weapons against the Forerunners. Additionally, they could manipulate space-time, rendering Forerunner slipspace travel ineffective. There are four stages that galactic historians use to classify the severity of a flood outbreak. They are as follows. The feral stage. The flood are at their simplest form. They communicate via pheromones and have the instinct to harvest enough calcium to establish a viable grave mind. After a grave mind has been established and begins relaying orders to the flood, the coordinated stage begins. Soon after, the flood will begin to make strategic advancements on intelligent species to commandeer and utilize their spacefaring technology, starting the interstellar stage. Once the interstellar stage begins, the flood will immediately transition to the final and most devastating stage, transgalactic. At this point, the flood will have consumed virtually all organic matter in its galaxy of origin and will then move its forces into uninfected galaxies to continue reproduction on a scale that would continue until all life in the universe has been assimilated. The magnitude of such an event would likely be beyond even the most advanced technology used to purge the flood. In this scenario, all hope would truly be lost. But hope lies in discovering a permanent solution to the flood before this stage is inevitably reached. He felt the grave mind before he heard it. A little nudge, a soft tap, tap, tap on the fleshy surface of his brain. A worm and a slither. Tremors skated up his spine, and he shook his head violently against the intrusion, fighting, writhing like a captured fish. His heart leapt and began a quick, panicked beat as the air turned thick and difficult to breathe. Shadow of sand and star. The deep, gravelly voice clicked and rumbled, each forced syllable resonating through him like a drum. Die, die. Protect you of the Akiri. We need to die. A bolt of recognition erupted, lighting through the nerve centers in his body. Denial quickly followed. How could the primordial be here of all places? Last he knew, the ancient creature claiming to be the last precursor had been taken from its time lock on Sharum Hakor and imprisoned on one of the Master Builder's ring worlds. Could it be? 
It seemed to lift the question from his mind like tugging out the smallest blood vessel and slowly unraveling, stretching it taut. It spoke directly to the receptors in his brain. We are the same. That one, this one, others. The one he'd met on Charum Hakor, however, was nothing like this monster emerging now from the darkness. Like an expanding nest of thick serpents pulling a glutinous mound of flood victims, it came tentacles first, feeling its way along. No eyes to see, only a few mouths and tongues in differing stages of mutation. Despite counseling himself to stay calm, the didact's survival instincts responded. Panic threaded its way into the primitive parts of his brain. He struggled against the grappler, barely noticing the blow it sent back trying desperately to look away as tentacles glistening with secretion and blood and gut-turning growths reached for him. It was already in his mind, sinking into his memory, his subconscious, his essence. There was no small corner it did not invade. It completely absorbed everything. The violation sparked a flare of outrage. How could this horror and humiliation be his end? His species, and all species, were hovering on the precipice of annihilation. And for what? You have damned the entire galaxy for revenge ten million years old, he raged. The ridiculousness of it, the waste and perversity, caused tears to fall from his eyes. His muscles shook so badly his teeth rattled in his mouth, but there was no way to usher in a state of calm. He was losing control of his bodily functions. You should have punished my ancestors then, he gasped. There are entire species and civilizations, innocent. What wrong have they done? They have yet to know suffering. This we shall bring to them with unrelenting dedication. All are instruments and receivers of our vengeance. The didact's laughter rattled through his chest. He shook his head, his vitality fading. He knew he was going to die, felt the cold disorientation, the intermittent panic, and the utter absurdity of his body betraying him. Everything that you do is an abomination, he snarled, gathering what was left of his animosity. An affront to the very laws and tenets your kind created. Just as you were set to destroy us, that is why we rose against you. Forerunners, humans, millions of other species from the dawn of time, beyond and before, we create, we delete. It is our nature, it is our right. You breathe hypocrisy. And forerunners never see the mantle for what it is. A test, merely. And all ultimately fail. Humanity will be tested next. And like you, they will feed and grow fat on preeminence and power. And righteousness. And when they are at their ripest, the flood will feast once 